Desire Heavenly Father Spirit to attend with us here this morning because we have a desire in our hearts to do right and do our Heavenly Father's will. And I seek that through doing our prophet's will. How I yearn the Lord will give us an increase that we won't pass by this training unused. The Lord told us we were under condemnation. He said the great disease among the young people and people in general is the disease called unbelief. Today in our training, we should see how we must apply what we are taught. The first step of faith is belief, and that is usually how far most people go. They say they believe, but they don't stay faithful if they do not take it to the next step. The prophet Brigham Young said, never expect the Lord to just go build the city Zion and have it all ready for us and then we show up. He's not going to come and plant our trees, clean our dishes, build our houses, the streets. The Lord is going to teach us how. And as we exert ourselves in faithful obedience, he will give the increase to our effort. We must do our part. We must reach out and show our faith by our works. And as we go forth to do a work, believing the Lord will give the increase, then we are blessed. But it takes each person doing their part. We know Heavenly Father has all power, yet He does not come down and live our lives for us. But He puts all the blessings around us, all the abilities to do right, and allows us to choose to do the right. He will never go against our agency. He will allow us to choose Dear young people, by not choosing, you have chosen. By not choosing to live by faith and reach out and exert yourself, you have chosen the opposite. Faith is the first principle of the gospel, or the way of life by which we accomplish all other good. Faith is exerted through prayer, and it is shown by obedience. How does a man work when he works by faith, says the prophet Joseph? We understand that when a man works by faith, he works by mental exertion instead of physical force. It is by words instead of exerting his physical powers with which every being works when he works by faith. What kind of situation can you tell where faith is stronger than force, physical force? I offer you this challenge, a test to see if faith is stronger than force. In your family, perhaps you have someone you don't get along with as well as you should. There's always a fight or feelings. Force is calling to your aid an evil influence. Fighting is an evil influence. Forcing the other person to think the way you do or give in to your will. But just try the greater power. That person you usually have a struggle with. Go ask Heavenly Father to bless you to get along with that person. Ask Him to bless that person. 
and tell him you're willing to do whatever you need to for him to give the increase. Faith is trusting in a greater power than ourselves. And then you go and do your part and watch. All the arguing will stop and you will finally see your friends right within your own family. The Lord expects us to do our part, but he wants us to rely on him as we do it. And we turn to him in faith that he will give the increase as we do our work. Daily we give you jobs called assignments. Some of you jump in and just go after it, hardly even saying a prayer. Sometimes you succeed, but sometimes you really fail. And those low grades should humble you to where you will include Heavenly Father in everything. We get going along in life, living our habits, hardly even thinking of Heavenly Father. And then we just blame our failures on circumstance. But Heavenly Father has organized us in such a way that he places within us the ability to reach out in faith for his strength, for his increase. And he says, if you remember him, he will remember us and bless us if we're obedient. The words we teach you are like a seed planted in the ground. And there's many different types of ground. If a seed lands in ground that's shallow, or there's no room for the root to grow, even though the same truth is given you, that it's given others, if your ground is shallow, then the seed won't grow. But the prophet Alma said, try just try to plant a seed of these truths that you're hearing. Just believe that Jesus is the Christ and President Jeff is the prophet. And pray about it. When you plant a seed, you know you must water it. Make sure it's in the good soil. You must make sure there's plenty of light or sh sunshine. And thus it is, with the truths of priesthood that God lives and President Jeff is his prophet. The light that you feed it with is the words of the prophets. They are light to us. The water you water the seed with is obedience through prayer. And you nourish the seed praying for a stronger testimony and understanding and then you will notice a strength growing within you, like a strong tree growing within. A testimony of your own where you know the things you're being taught are true. You just feel it. You say you know it. And this is how we grow by faith. The effects of faith, the results of faith, can be felt. They are real. It's not an imaginary thing. Just like when you plant a seed, you see the sprouts come out of the ground. And by nourishing it, it will grow into a mighty tree, a strong testimony. If the results of faith are not with you, that means you are not nourishing the seed. I stand here and testify the truth has been given you. The seed has been planted. And if you're not finding joy, strength, and happiness in the word of God through the prophets, most probably you're not nourishing the seed. 
So a seed of faith is planted in you, a truth of priesthood is taught. You take that, you believe it. You tend it and keep all doubt or all the weeds away. You come away from that which destroys it and keep close to the prophet and your good parents. And let the light shine. Give it the nourishment of your own effort, of prayerful obedience. And something happens inside that faithful person. They start to see as the prophet sees. They have a strength in doing right because they nourish the seed. All things around you exist because someone first had faith. You look at this building here. It used to be a field of weeds. Uncle Roy told President Jeffs, go build a meeting house and get your family under one roof. He didn't have the money, but he had the confidence that the prophet's word would be fulfilled. It didn't exist. It was faith. It was in his mind first. And by working it and working with his family and others, Stick by stick it went up. And today you and I just partake of it. The house is here as our school building. But everything you see here is because someone believed it could be here and then they put that belief into action. And you can take it beyond this building. The mountains, the sky, the clouds, the sun, this earth we live on. All things that exist are because someone first believed and then went forth to obey and follow that belief with good works. Until Heavenly Father gained all knowledge, until he can say his prayers and command the elements, and they obey. All things around us are the result of faith in an intelligent being. And thus it is with us. There are a few sentences I want you to underline in this lecture. Follow along with me. I want to start reading verse 7 and then underline a sentence in verse 8. Do it right in your books. I would suggest a pencil. Later on, do it with a red pencil if you can. Therefore it is said, and appropriately too, that without faith it is impossible to please God. If it should be asked, why is it impossible to please God without faith? The answer would be, because without faith, it is impossible for men to be saved. And as God desires the salvation of men, he must, of course, desire that they should have faith. And he could not be pleased unless they had, or else he could be pleased with their destruction. From this we learn that the many exhortations which have been given by inspired men to those who had received the word of the Lord to have faith in him were not mere commonplace matters. The subject of faith, obedience, is not just a, a side issue. This is the important thing in life. But were for the best of all reasons, and that was because without it, without faith, there was no salvation, neither in this world nor in that which is to come. Please underline this next sentence, for this summarizes this principle of faith and the lectures on faith. When men begin to live by faith, they begin to draw near to God, and when faith is perfected, they are like him.
faith causes you to draw near to God and his prophet. And as you live by it, you gradually become like God. And when your faith is perfect, it will be because you are like him. And that, <clears throat> that is the end of our faith. That's the subject we're talking about. We are here to become like our Heavenly Father. And because He is saved, they are saved also. For they will be in the same situation He is in, because they have come to Him. And when He appears, they shall be like Him, for they will see Him as He is. You know, people go on a spurt for a while. They get all enthused. They seem to stay faithful and all the way for the prophet for a time. But then they weary in well-doing and they quit or at least lessen their efforts. I want to encourage you. You cannot stop living by faith until you're like God. And you will find that once you become like Him, you will still live by faith. Faith is an eternal principle, an eternal way of life. Don't we often feel like listening to the temptations of evil, like prayer is a pain? I tell you, that's a temptation of evil you must resist. I remind you even our Lord and Savior when he was resurrected and then appeared to the Nephites he still prayed he had faith the Lord or his father would bless the disciple and when he saw the father bless the disciples and filled them with the spirit of God he went back and said another prayer thank you father for answering my prayers So do not weary in saying prayers. And usually, people weary because they don't see a result. The result of faith. And that is because they're not exerting their faith right. Faith exerted properly will bring forth the right result. Now reading down verse 9 talking how all things are the effect of faith. He asks the question, what is the difference between a saved man and one who is not saved? And right in the middle of that paragraph, underline this sentence. And what constitutes the real difference between a saved person and one not saved is the difference in the degree of their faith. One's faith has become perfect enough to lay hold upon eternal life, and the other has not. Underline that sentence. He asks, where can we find a saved being or a prototype, an example? And he gives another truth I want you to underline. Bottom of page 43. We think it will not be a matter of dispute that, and underline this part, two beings who are unlike each other cannot both be saved. Underline that phrase. For whatever constitutes the salvation of one will constitute the salvation of every creature which shall be saved. And he asks, where should we find a saved being? His answer, we all agree it is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why is he saved? It is because he is a just and holy being. And I want you to underline this next part, top of 44. It's 
starts with the word and. And if he, talking of our Savior, were anything different from what he is, he would not be saved. For his salvation depends on his being precisely what he is and nothing else. For if it were possible for him to change in the least degree, so sure he would fail of salvation and lose all his dominion, power, authority, and glory, which constitute salvation. I'll rephrase it. Character is everything. To be saved we must be like him. And God is perfect in his character and changes not. The prophet goes on and says, he is following a process of improvement, always increasing, changing for the better. But his character never changes toward the evil character. And it says, no being can possess salvation but himself or one like him. Now the last couple of sentences of this verse 9. Please underline that. Once you have a faith growing into a hope of eternal salvation, this next training, these next sentences I want you to underline show, it will be according to your effort. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he, God, is pure. Why purify themselves as he is pure? Because if they do not, they cannot be like him. As a faith starts to grow in you, you awaken to the truth. You must be like God. And that will make you go forth and purify yourself into his likeness. He goes on to say, No being can enjoy the glory of God without possessing his perfections and holiness. Then the prophet Joseph explains that the Father and the Son are one. And they are one because they are alike and filled with the same Spirit or the Holy Spirit, the mind of the Father. Going to verse 15. About the third line down, underline this phrase. Talking of the Father and the Son being perfect in their character and attributes. And that if they were lacking in one attribute or perfection which they have, the glory which they have never could be enjoyed by them. For it requires them to be precisely what they are in order to enjoy it. And if the Savior gives this glory to any others, he must do it in the very way set forth in his prayer to his Father by making them one in him, as he and the Father are one. So mark it down in your notes. To be one with the Father and the Son, we must be like them. We must be perfect in having the same character as they do. The Lord said, if ye are not one, ye are not mine. If we're rebellious, won't exert our faith unto perfect hope. If we're unwilling to change to the great gift of repentance, we are not his. He will reject us. These truths are painting the true picture in your mind. That the work we're part of is a lifelong labor of becoming like God and it's done by the little actions moment by moment now underline 
either all of verse 16 or at least the second half of it. These teachings of the Savior most clearly show unto us the nature of salvation and what he proposed unto the human family when he proposed to save them. That he proposed to make them like unto himself. <coughs> and he was, <coughs> he was like the Father, <coughs> the great prototype of all saved beings. And for any portion of the human family to be assimilated into their likeness is to be saved. And to be unlike them is to be destroyed. And on this hinge turns the door of salvation. I assign you to memorize this verse 16. I'd like you to underline a few verses or a few lines in verse 17. At the top it says, Hence we are told that without faith it is impossible to please God. A little further down, talking of the nature of salvation, about the middle of the page, that it was a system of faith. It begins with faith and continues by faith and every blessing which is obtained in relation to it, our salvation, is the effect of faith. So stop moaning or being sad that you don't have certain blessings. Go work at it. Earn your blessings by faithfulness. All blessings come through faith. About three-fourths of the way down the page, underline this phrase. Every man received according to his faith. According as his faith was, so were his blessings and privileges. At least underline that part. And nothing was withheld from him when his faith was sufficient to receive it. He could stop the mouths of lions, quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword, wax valiant in fight, and put to flight the armies of the aliens or the enemy. Women could, by their faith, receive their dead children to life again. And now underline this next phrase. In a word, there was nothing impossible with them who had faith. All things were subject to the saints in former days, according as their faith was. The last part of this lecture describes what the ultimate purpose and end of our faith will be. What is the great result we must have through faith in order to be saved? He centers on this one important word, knowledge. We must live by faith until we know God. And the prophets have taught us to know him, we must see him with our eyes, hear him with our ears, touch him with our hands. But even if God himself was to appear, how would you know it was Heavenly Father or the devil? The only way you can truly know him when you see him is to be filled with his spirit and be like him. That's how you will know him. You will know his spirit because it molds you toward the good. And when he appears, you must be like him. And seeing him that is when you will know him face to face. Talk about a job. Talk about a life's mission. We are not through saying our prayers or performing our obedience until we're like him and can see him. 
and then we'll find we'll continue in that same path verse 17 18 19 I'd like you to underline the word knowledge everywhere you find it I would like when we take our next morning class test to see these things are underlined bring these books and I'll walk around and take a preparation he says knowledge is more than faith but knowledge comes through faith knowledge implies more than faith and notice that all things that pertain to life and godliness were given through the knowledge of God through faith they were to obtain this knowledge do you see why people that just don't really believe don't really put the effort of obedience they never come to know God they're always fearful, doubting, holding back all these things come through faith and you don't quit using faith until you know a thing you don't quit part way so we must obtain the knowledge of God and we know him by becoming like him through faith how great must be our desire our determination to gain this knowledge through faith read page 49 with me and this is the reason that Paul counted all things but filth and dross what he formerly called his gain he called his loss yea and underline this sentence he counted all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus the Lord because to obtain the faith by which he could enjoy the knowledge of Christ Jesus the Lord he had to suffer the loss of all things he was willing to sacrifice all earthly things and especially his earthly fallen nature this is the reason that the former day saints knew more and understood more of heaven and of heavenly things than all others besides because this information is the effect of faith to be obtained by no other means now underline this next sentence and this is the reason that men as soon as they lose their faith run into strifes contentions darkness and difficulties did you know that? whenever you fight whenever you argue you have lost your faith, you've set aside your prayers and your obedience and you're darkened for the knowledge which tends to life disappears with faith if you stop using faith darkness takes over but returns the Spirit of God returns when faith returns a little further down underline this sentence for where faith is there will the knowledge of God be also so dear young people don't sit back and just believe and then do nothing faith is a way of life and it has a result you begin to draw near to God until by continuing you become like him that is why we read the scriptures so much to study what he is like where we need to change and as you find out you're not like God you have some improvement to make exert your faith turn first to faith use it it's a tool it's the exertion of the mind through words and it's obedience to fulfill that desire we must not quit and there is no quitting in this work but continue in faith until you are like him
there's an event in your life that will yet take place for you to come into the presence of God. It is called having your calling and election made sure. For God himself will appear to you and say, My son, thou shalt be exalted. And the women, they will be called forth into the Lord's presence through their husbands who are worthy of that blessing. This lecture is painting the true picture in our minds that we can never set aside faith. And the prophet Nephi explained the feeling within us to not pray, to not live by faith, is the whispering of an evil spirit and the weakness of this fallen body. I yearn you young people will just have the habit to pray how should it be right now? The instant you wake up in the morning, you'll be saying a prayer. At least every hour, and before every job or game, you'll say a prayer. As you complete a job, you'll return a thank you prayer and ask for his continued guidance and protection. Young people, you have taken upon you the gospel and the way of life that leads you unto God. Live unto him. It's done through this faith. For the rest of this school year, we will read many stories in the Book of Mormon. Lessons on faith. I yearn that you won't set this aside, feeling like well, you've read the lectures again. Now you understand it, you think. You really don't understand a thing until you do it. And it becomes part of you. Please read the summary of Lecture 7 again tonight, along with Chapter 1 and 2 of Ether in the Book of Mormon. And we'll start into our Book of Mormon lessons tonight. So mark it down. Faith is that inward energy that empowers us to do right. That inward energy is a gift from God. Today, I'd like the 11th and 12th grade to go with Brother D. Jessup and process the meat for the storehouse. If they need more help, we'll call for more help and we'll continue our classes and ask the 11th and 12th grade to find out your assignments and complete them tonight. If you're not needed, please come back to your classes. <laughs> 